Hello and welcome to Aberone's Armorial. Today I'm going to be talking about, well, not talking about, more of going on a little bit of a rant about the term family coat of arms. That's probably the biggest misconception in the entire heraldry world. Now, if you have ever been told, or you ever think that you have a family coat of arms, I am sorry to say that whoever gave you that information is probably wrong. And as I say that, there's going to be comments barreling about, well, this is what my parents did for me, or this is what they said at the Renaissance Festival, or something like that. And as fun and nice as some of those sentiments are usually as gifts and such, Family coats of arms in the real world of heraldry do not exist in really any way, shape, or form. Now, that misconception mostly comes from, well, A, people peddling what we call bucket shop, fake heraldry, that is. You usually see that myth perpetuated at things like uh, Highland Games and Renaissance festivals and that sort of thing. Now, the reason why that is, is mainly because it's oft, so often perpetuated in places where there is a small heraldic authority that's not exactly government run, or if it is, it doesn't have a lot of power, or there is no authority at all. And what I mean by a heraldic authority is something like the Court of Lord Lyon, King of Arms in Scotland, or perhaps the College of Arms in London, or even the Canadian Heraldic Authority. Now, the idea of family coat of arms is also probably stems, well, also probably stems, sorry for my misspeak there, also probably stems from the undereducation about heraldic candidacy, or cadency, depending on how you want to pronounce it. It's pronounced either way. I've heard people pronounce it both ways. And that is the differencing of arms so that other members of a family may use similar arms. So already there, that's understandable how that can get misconstrued. So how candidacy works, really, and this is short, this is just going to be a short explanation because I'm going to have an entire video dedicated to different types of heraldic candidacy. How candidacy works, basically, is, let's say, I have arms, and I have a son, or I have two sons. Let's say I have two sons. They both want to display the arms, and depending on the law in your respective area, they might be able to do so. But they display it in right of you. It is not their arms, it is their father's arms. Now, I don't have any children, I'm being hypothetic in this instance. But, so, if I have two sons, and this is going to be a reflection of the British heraldic system that's used mostly in Britain, Canada, Scotland, you know, all of the other places. And when I say British heraldry, that really umbrella terms it to be both the British Isles and abroad that were formerly British possessions, usually Commonwealth nations nowadays, and some places like America. America, by default, normally uses the British system. So, stepping back, and some of these vary country to country, but in England, for example, you have a label of three points. And that's literally just a bar with three little tines coming down off of it. It looks like a flat, compressed E going across the shield. And it'll either go all the way across the top of the shield, or it'll be centered somewhere, usually in chief, meaning in the top half of the shield. And that is to denote the heir. Now, there's a misconception saying that's the firstborn son. Usually the firstborn son is the heir, but in some places like Canada, the eldest daughter is allowed to display a label of three points if she is to inherit the arms, and in Canada that works. Whereas in Britain, in the British Isles usually, women can't inherit differenced arms, so they use their father's arms on a lozenge or an oval, and that's a completely different topic. But first son will bear the shield, would bear my shield with a label of three points. My second son, I follow the Scottish system, so that my second son would have a gold border around the arms. 
or in the British system, I believe it's a crescent is the second sun chart. I'd have to look. It's in the pile of books over there. But it's not, it's done so that no one per, so no two people bear the same arms. And that's important. And, you know, nowadays it's a little less important, but back in the day when this is being painted onto your breastplate or worn on a surcoat or something like that or carried in a banner in procession, you know, oh, that's not so-and-so, that's so-and-so's son or that's their grandkid or something like that. And again, it develops from this whole idea that the shield itself is not an indicator of rank, but it's an indicator of identity. So that's the other misconception about the whole family coat of arms. If you think you are special because you have a family coat of arms, again, I'm sorry. Now, that makes you wonder, well, if you don't have an ar a family coat of arms, do you have any arms at all? And that's the next part. Maybe. It's a very large maybe, to be precise. So, arms can be obtained one of several ways. There's really three main, well, three main ways that that can be done. Either by a new grant, matriculation, matriculation, it's pronounced a few different ways. I say it that way, I know I probably say it wrong, but that's how I usually read it as. And then assumption or adoption. Now, in England, in Scotland especially, and in Canada, the most, the most legal way to achieve armorial status is to have arms granted to you by a heraldic authority. So, like I said, in England there is the College of Arms, in Scotland there's the Court of Lord Lion, that sort of thing. And how that process works is basically you find out if you have an authority, you petition that authority, you pay the fee, which is usually several thousand dollars US, several thousand pounds sterling. And you basically work with a herald, they will track down your genealogy for you and determine if you are worthy of receiving arms, and then you pay the fee and they just, you come up with a design and boom, you get a nice fancy sheet and there you go, you have arms. Second option, matriculation, is I am so-and-so's grandson, so-and-so had arms, I can't remember what they look like or I know what they look like, but I want them re-registered to my name to keep the line updated. Now what that means is I can go to the college arms and say, hello, my grandfather was so, so, so and so OB. Oh yes, he had arms. They'll check you off in a book, then they'll pull it out and they say, hand me your registration fee. You write a check and they issue a new document that basically says that you have taken over the arms because you are the nearest male descendant to that person. So those arms now translate from them to you. Now arms are heritable property, which means that when I die, I pass my arms down. Now that happens sometimes and people forget about it or people don't realize that it's anything special. So it's recommended by most heraldic authorities that every other generation, so usually grandparents to grandchildren, have a matriculation, a matriculation, how do you want to pronounce it, over and over to make sure that the record book stays fresh. And that also ensures that your arms are still legal, they're still up to date, they're still protected. Because armory is very much a copyright more than anything else. It's, it's your property, it's making sure that it's still registered in your name, in your kid's name, that sort of thing. And when you petition for a grant of arms, you're going to put down every son and grandson you have. Now this also works for collateral branches. So let's say my grandfather has arms. And... I am the first son of his first son, but my younger, my dad's younger brother, for example, my father had a younger brother and he had a son. The younger brother of my grandfather or the younger son of my grandfather would have his mark of candidacy and then his son would also have a mark. So if he wanted to keep using that, it would be a good idea for that person to go and get a matriculation from the, <laughs> from the Kings of Arms and then they can make sure that it's registered in their name so that the arms travel down the line differenced. Or they might go and get something completely new made and that then becomes a the new arms for that branch of the family. And that's how you end up with collateral branches. <laughs> now, the next part is adoption. 
several places there is no heraldic authority. The America is probably the biggest one. Or there's countries where there is an authority or there's a registry of some sort, but they're not the sole law of the land. Like, for example, in Scotland, the Lord Lion, King of Arms, and his office is the only heraldic authority in Scotland. And it is a law. And when I mean law, I mean it is a written law in their court. And it is an actual legal court that if you invent bogus arms and use them in Scotland, you can be fined a very serious fine. Or if you try to use symbols of rank that are not conferred by Lord Lyon, serious legal action can be taken against you. In England, it's not so harsh, but again, you can still be, you know, these are your arms, they're no way legitimate. And in Canada, Canada's a little different. They have a state-run heraldic authority, but it's not the sole law of the land. While those arms are very much legal, as assumed arms are very much legal, they're not to the same quality, they're not to the same fiber as a granted arms. So for example, if you were a Canadian and you decided to assume arms onto yourself, and then the Canadian Heraldic Authority decided to grant somebody else arms that are exactly the same as yours, the likelihood of that happening is slim, but still, if they did, or it was too close, and you say, wait a minute, I've been using my assumed arms longer than that person has. How come they get to, how come you do that? And you take it to court and they'll go, well, your arms aren't real. So you have to go here. Now, that's what hiccups people on adoption. Now, some people in the UK think that Americans who adopt arms, Americans have no heraldic authority, so we are free to do that. Most countries in Europe have no heraldic authority, so they are free to adopt arms. So a lot of people in countries where there is an authority will say, oh, you have adopted arms, you're not a real arm return. It's like, no, in the UK I'm not. Just as much as if somebody from England traveled to Scotland and said, these are my arms, Lord Lyon would go, no, they're not. You haven't registered them with us, so they're not legal. Same thing would happen in Canada. Same thing would happen in America, technically. If you didn't adopt your arms in the U.S., you technically shouldn't be displaying them because they're not adopted in that country. So Americans can do an adoption of arms or an assumption of arms, it's often called. And what that means is they find an independent herald. I have done this before for people. You go, you find somebody who's well-versed in heraldry, they work with you to design new arms and you adopt it, and then the best place to do is, thing to do is register them everywhere. And there are several things. The New England Historic and Genealogical Society Committee on Heraldry is probably the best, best and oldest, so much so that it's an independent society that recognizes arms, and it has been recognized by both Lord Lyon and the College of Arms since about 1910. And it's been around since the 1860s. So that's that, that gives pretty much it bearing. There's also several other registries, like I run my own registry and things like that, and I'm not in any way advertising my business, but, you know, there are several ways to do that. Now, getting back to the topic of the family coat of arms thing. In a few countries, well, I should even say that, in a few areas at different points in history, there were such thing as family coats of arms. And what I mean by that is, the shield might have stayed the same with everybody in the family of that particular line. It wasn't just anybody with the surname of this, that's their arms. No, it was, well, if you're all descended from this family, you're of this house, this shield is yours. But your crest is different. The crest is a little bit that goes on top of the helmet. So saying that there's a family crest is also stupid because the crest is only one part of the greater achievement of arms. So... While you might have the same shield, the crest might change. So if your last name is Habsburg, for example, and you're an American, you don't get to display the Habsburg arms because chances are you're not a descendant of the main line or something else. I don't know. Kilcher is another one. That's another German name that I've heard over here. German Swiss name. Dutch name, too. It's common all over that part of Europe. But people were like, well, everybody in this family gets to use that. And it's like, no, if you're that main line, yes. But anybody with that last name doesn't work. And the same thing is true with the Irish and the Scots, which are the two biggest groups that you go. And if I go to a games and I look up, oh, it's the MacDonald family coat of arms. It's usually a really poor rendition of my chief's arms or just a blatant knockoff. 
when you see that, it's fake. So yeah, that's the story behind Family Codes of Arms. Now, do not despair, do not lose hope. If you think you have a Family Code of Arms and you live in England, go ta contact the College of Arms. Most Scots realize that that is a thing, so. But if you do and you're in Scotland, go contact Lord Lyon. If you're in Canada, contact the Canadian Heraldic Authority. And if you're in America, look on heraldry groups. There's the New England Historic and Genealogical Society. There's the American College of Heraldry. There's an American College of Arms. Uh, a good help for a lot of people that I have found, wherever you are in the world, there is a heraldry Discord server as well. Shout out to all the guys there that pretty much inspired me to start this channel. So yeah, I would reach out there. And as I don't want to keep any videos too long, this is where I will leave you. And as always, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe down below. And if you have any questions, you can comment or email us. Have a good evening. Thank you.